Uh, and it's with great pleasure uh, that I welcome Mr. Benjamin Perks, Head of Campaigns and Advocacy at UNICEF in New York. And you've recently published the report State of the World's Children with focus on mental health. Uh, I think it's good morning to you, Benjamin, isn't it? Yes, good morning. It's quite <laughs> early. It's about 8.40 here yeah. <laughs> with you. Thank you for, uh, for going up so early this morning. And please just uh, share your findings uh, within this report. Welcome, Benjamin. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. We launched the report at the Global uh, Mental Health Summit uh, in Paris the week before last. Uh, Dr. Lazari was there, was there with us. Um, before I talk about the findings, I think I just want to, because it's early here, I just want to start off with a little bit of a story about the journey from the uh, summit to the airport to uh, after the summit had finished. Um, we, we, uh, we, uh, our taxi didn't arrive, so the hotel manager um, organized one of the retired neighbors who does occasional driving to take us. And we had the long journey to the airport in rush hour. And after we'd exhausted all of these um, topics, uh, his football team, Paris Saint-Germain, my football team, uh, COVID, Brexit, Boris Johnson, Macron, and all of that, he turned and asked me what I was doing in Paris. And I said, I was at the Mental Health Summit to launch uh, a report and an advocacy campaign on child and adolescent mental health because we believe we can dramatically uh, improve outcomes for children and outcomes for the whole of society by investing in child and adolescent mental health. And often when you speak about mental health, you know that people switch off, but he had that, he, he had the look of somebody that wanted to hear more. So I basically explained that uh, we, 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 the evidence seems to tell us that when horrible things happen to kids like abuse and neglect, that is the biggest preventable uh, cause of poor mental health and um, things like uh, associated things like addiction, obesity, and intergenerational violence. And he went very quiet for about a minute. Uh, and then he, his face kind of lit up and he said, I have to tell you my story. And, and this sometimes happens when you talk about mental health and, and childhood. He said that when he'd grown up, he had grown up in a family where he didn't feel loved and where occasionally he'd been uh, humiliated. And he, he had spent most of his life being kind of very defensive uh, and, and not having the type of quality relationships that he may have wanted. But then his granddaughter had started studying to be a psychologist. And she started this whole conversation with him about things like attachment theory and toxic stress. And he didn't really understand most of it. But on a personal level, he realized that he realized in retirement that his whole life had been determined by what had happened to him in, in childhood and he sought therapy. And he said that he feels young again because through the therapy, it's opened up a whole new way of looking uh, at life. He wished he'd done it much earlier, but he was so grateful for having the opportunity to do it through the studies of his granddaughter. I got out of the, uh, the taxi, we fist bumped and I went to go and check in. And as I was searching for uh, the app, you know, the, the, the COVID app where you can show that you've been vaccinated. I thought for a moment between the link about what he was saying and the story of COVID, because the situation that he's in is as common as COVID. Uh, people around the world, maybe a third of the population are affected by these kind of issues. But within um, a couple of weeks of, uh, of the COVID pandemic striking, most people knew the pathways through which they could become affected, infected, what they could do to, be, to prevent being infected and how to respond if they were. And yet when we think about mental health and we think about this guy's journey, the pathways are also very straightforward. We, we know and understand that adverse childhood experiences and early trauma is a massive driver of lifelong um, poor mental health outcomes if it's unaddressed. Yet we don't speak about it, we don't understand it, and the populations don't have basic literacy in, uh, in the issue. And so we, when I think about the state of the world's children, part of our goal is to really open up a conversation and an understanding 
all around the world. And it's a, it's our flagship report. Uh, we will disseminate it across 190 countries around the world. We will use it for advocacy and policy dialogue with governments to really promote investment in child and adolescent mental health and recognizing that the full range of uh, mental health issues, it is often in childhood that they start. And if we can invest early in prevention at population levels, we can make a massive game-changing difference. I'm going to now try and share my screen with some slides. Um, okay, can you see that? Yes. Great, so the um, State of the World's Children, this is our flagship report. It's been around for 40 years. It comes out every second year. It's the first time that we are doing it on mental health and we are running it alongside a global advocacy drive uh, on, on mental health with, with a platform called On My Mind, which you can follow on social media. I think the first thing to say is the framing of mental health Within, uh, within the report. And the, the Lancet um, reflected uh, on the way, in, a, in an editorial last week, on the way that um, we're trying to reframe mental health as a global thing, something we all have, and something that is positive. Any given time, we are all on a mental health spectrum. And uh, one of our policy priorities should be to do everything we can as societies to make sure that we are on the positive side um, uh, of that spectrum when we can be. Um, it would be hard to talk about mental health without talking about child and adolescent mental health without talking a little bit about COVID. I know we've covered that in the last presentation, but just to remind delegates at the, uh, the, the summit here that, that COVID-19 has been a turbo, turbo booster for every form of inequality, vulnerability, and risk that children face, including lost connections, grief, and fear. And these are some of the comments that young people from different parts of the world, I think you can all see them on the screen, that different parts of the world shared about, uh, about their experiences and feelings uh, of, of the pandemic. Uh, we, um, when we, on some data points, one in seven, uh, children and adolescents aged 10 and 19 have a diagnosable mental disorder. Um, and every 11 minutes, a child takes their own life. So in this opening session of, of, uh, of, of the summit, five children will take their life um, as a result of suicide. But in most parts of the world, there's no response to that. You know, if we look, for example, at the continent of Africa, there is uh, one, uh, one mental health professional per 100,000 population. So, so there, there is not the infrastructure to deal with this global problem. Uh, suicide is the fourth greatest cause of, um, uh, of mortality amongst adolescents in the world and the second in Europe. Uh, in turn, this is a very focused figure here looking at um, disability, the cost of disability adjusted life years, but an enormous amount of money is lost through our failure to uh, address child and adolescent mental health. And there are other studies that complement this work, for example, adverse child experience studies and violence against children studies that show that the risk factor, the mental health risk factors for children in terms of lifelong outcomes often the costing can be in the, in the trillions when we look at a, a global picture. So the, 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 uh, mental, uh, as Dr. Lazari said, there is uh, no country in the world that spends enough on, on, on mental health. Mental health is 30% uh, of the non-fatal disease burden, but less than 2% of what governments spend on, uh, on average in health budgets. And when we think about it, mental health is not actually just a health thing. A lot of the work that goes on to improve mental health needs to happen in schools, in social protection systems, in our workplace, and they are spending much less than 2%. We looked a lot in this study at risk factors and protective factors. So the, uh, the protective factors are clearly primary and secondary uh, attachment, the attachments that kids have in the home, like the taxi driver to Paris, if they have 
positive, healthy, nurturing, uh, uh, attached relationships. That's a, that's a massive protective factor. Also, secondary attachment in school and community, belonging, connection, all of those things. Um, risk factor is, uh, is, is violent discipline, poor perinatal care, things like bullying, uh, being abandoned and early marriage and other forms of, of, of violence are clear risk factors. We also know that poverty, inequality, racism also contribute to poor mental health of children. Sorry, I clicked on the wrong one. Can you still see the next slide with 83%? Yeah, 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 I right, see the rest right. like, yeah. So, so this thing about connection is something that young people themselves tell us is really, really important. 83% of uh, 15 to 24 year olds believe that sharing experiences and seeking support is the best way to address mental health, uh, health concerns. So what do we need to do to address child and adolescent mental health and therefore contribute to overall mental health in the long term? It's obvious we have to reduce the uh, risk factors, do everything we can to reduce the risk factors and do everything we can to, to uh, strengthen and expand protective factors. We need to recognize that addressing mental health in childhood requires a population level um, uh, intervention that is culturally relevant and builds on the, on the similarities across the world and builds on, on, on learning from different contexts, but also is culturally uh, relevant to the, to the context. And recognizing that in many parts of the world, uh, in, in low and middle income countries, but also in often underserved parts of high income countries, mental health has never been really discussed. There's a lot of stigma and taboo about it. We need to build systems that can cut through that and address it. I, uh, I want to talk a little bit about our advocacy work because that's really my interest. Uh, in advocacy globally, we have learned very much from the child survival revolution of the 1980s. I don't, I don't know if uh, participants know this, but in 1982, 10% of the world's children did not reach the age of five because of uh, deadly preventable disease. Uh, as a result of a, a major global drive, which was led by UNICEF and WHO and one or two others, there was, um, there was a, a massive effort to increase vaccine coverage. Only 20% of the kid, of, of children in the world were vaccinated against the five major childhood diseases. By the end of the decade, the coverage of vaccines had increased to 80%. Um, and child mortality in the years that followed halved in the world. What we learn about this from an advocacy point of view is you can't go to governments and say, we just need, you know, we've got a problem with mental health. We just need you to do these 375 different policy interventions and everything will be okay. We really need to focus our global effort on one or two interventions that can really drive forward uh, change in the broader advocacy um, area on mental health or the broader policy area on mental health. Of course, vaccines were the focus in the 80s, but they contributed to improving the entire public health and child and maternal health system. Um, so we are calling on governments to, uh, to, to consider the three Cs. The first one is a commitment to invest in child and adolescent mental health based on a realistic assessment, assessment of what not investing costs us as a society in terms of, uh, in terms of lost uh, opportunity, in terms of treatment and support, and in terms of social related social problems such as addiction, obesity, um, uh, violence, intergenerational violence, and so on. The second C is to ensure a good primary and secondary connection for every child through two interventions. The first one is parenting programs. We, we, along with WHO, will launch in November uh, a um, policy call for governments to uh, provide a minimum package of parenting, parenting support aimed at breaking the intergenerational transmission of trauma and for that to be available in every corner of the world. And we base that a little bit on the on the on the vaccine uh, approach of the 1980s. And we believe this can be a, a massive game changer in terms of child maltreatment as the primary preventable cause of uh, poor mental health. 
uh, and all of the related outcomes. The second one is on school programs. The second connection is on school programs, recognizing that for children who are affected by trauma um, and distress at home, it is often through a teacher or through connection at school that they can recover and find a pathway to a better future. And that is also has huge potential to contribute to breaking the intergenerational um, cycle uh, of, of trauma. The um, third C is about opening up a conversation globally without shame or stigma that increases literacy on, uh, on mental health. Dr. Lazari referred to the, the absence of literacy in populations on mental health, building up that understanding and, 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 and busting myths and also getting people to focus on solutions. We now know what the solutions are in terms of preventing and promoting mental health. We recognize that a lot of our um, advocacy at this stage is on population level prevention and promotion rather than, than, than treatment, but we also feel that part of the investment pool is about ensuring there is good treatment uh, for children and, uh, and adolescents. I, uh, I want to thank you very much for the opportunity, uh, again, to greet all of the delegates at this event, and I wish you a wonderful, uh, wonderful summit, and I'm happy to take any questions. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Benjamin, so much for this. Um, so interesting, and both of you, you are talking about the, the effects of the pandemic, and we will see these effects, I guess, over the years to come also, um, because it's it's early days uh, still. But but Benjamin, um, what are your expectations and, and hope for, for the use of this report? What what will be the effects of the report, do you think? I think it gives the I guess the 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 world and, and our offices and, and policymakers in different parts of the world a language with which to to, to with the kind of a global language or adolescent and mental health. It will be used in conversations with government in different ways in the countries where we are operational, which is almost every country in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, it is also something that we are launching with, we've launched already with the European Union. Uh, we will launch in a few weeks with the African Union. So building up regional uh, conversations about these three Cs. And we think it will be a tool for advocacy, but it will also open up conversations about how we can provide, uh, we can provide technical guidance and programming and support along with our colleagues at WHO to really massively improve mm. um, the health outcomes for children and adolescents. Excellent. And, and I mean, your organization is worldwide, so you, you have the means to, to spread this uh, all over the, the globe, actually.